But before we do that, let's go back to circa 2011. James O'Keefe is up on stage and he puts this graph up of a J-shaped mortality curve or of exercise. Can you, and, and by the way, at this point, Peter Atia sitting in the audience has probably just finished a four hour bike ride. And he's proud of the fact that he kept his heart rate above 172 <laughs> for half of that time. Can you walk people through basically, not that you remember that exact talk, but basically the thesis. Mm -hmm. It's a reverse J curve actually, because if exercise were a drug, it would be the best drug we have for preventing heart disease. Uh, I mean, for that matter, for preventing dementia, preventing osteoporosis, depression, diabetes, obesity. I mean, it is a wonder drug if it were a drug. But like with any drug, you got to get the dose right. Say you're using carvedilol, one of my favorite drugs, and you give somebody who has a fib or recent infarct or high blood pressure, you give them carvedilol, but it's one milligram. You don't get any benefit, right? On the other hand, you give them, you give them uh, 120 milligrams twice, twice a day. So if you give them 100 milligrams twice a day of carvedilol, it's a disaster. I mean, their blood pressure is going to be low. They'll feel terrible. I mean, right. they, they'd have a hard time getting up off the couch. Exactly. Right. So it's kind of the same thing with exercise. And amazingly, the dose of exercise to get benefit is really small. I mean, most 50% of Americans do no exercise. If they just got off the couch and went for a walk, a brisk walk, 15 minutes a day, they would get like a 30% reduction in serious cardiovascular disease, 15 minutes a day. Now, ideally, we, you know, we say 150 minutes a week is sort of a, a lower limit benefit. But the point is that early steep limb of the, of the survival versus exercise dose falls steeply. Your benefit goes down 30, 40, 50%. But then for the last uptick, the people doing the most extreme doses of exercise, you start to lose some benefit. And it's probably upwards of a third of the benefit. So people argue, well, I mean, no sense scaring people off of, of exercise. I mean, it's just sort of uh, an encouragement to, to not exercise, knowing that if you overdo it, you could make yourself worse. And, and, and to be clear, it's only like 2.5% of Americans who are probably overdoing exercise versus at least 50% who are underdoing exercise. But still, it's a bit like just because 50 to, well, 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. And it's like saying, well, we don't really want to talk about the dangers of anorexia because then, you know, we kind of will sort of discourage people from not eating as much. I mean, it's the mirror image of this. But the point is, you can overdo exercise. And, you know, it might be interesting. As just an example, I know that you swam the Catalina Channel like 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, that was a pretty amazing feat. So when you're sitting here talking to me and your heart is beating probably about 45 beats a minute and pumping out about five liters a minute of blood. When you're doing high intensity intervals, or when you're swimming across the Catalan Channel at, you know, I mean, a fast rate. I mean, you did that 20 miles in like 12 and a half, I mean, 10, 10 and a half hours. So actually, I think cycling is, a, is an even more amazing place to show that. Because actually, for the channel, I would probably, A, there's something about swimming where you're horizontal. I think your heart rate for very short distances can obviously climb like crazy. But I find on the bike you would get the highest heart rate. So, so for me, the maximum area under the curve heart rate was a one hour time trial. So, so like a 40 kilometer time trial would be absolutely maximum heart rate. How fast would it be going? I have a slow heart rate all round. So my max, my, my, my heart rate would be about 172 for, for that type of a race. For an hour. Well, take it less than an hour, probably. What, yes, exactly. Minutes. It would take about 54, 56 minutes, 55 minutes, maybe. No, but that's a perfect example because it's not only high heart rate, but it's exercising under a load. It's like rowing. You know, this is your, your, you're using big muscles. You know, your blood pressure is also probably 200. Your systolic pressure, your pulmonary pressure is probably 80. 60, 70, 80. I mean, let's give people some metrics of normal. So for obviously doctors listening to this will know what we're talking about, but let's take a step back. So let's say my blood pressure is, I have pretty normal blood pressure. I'm probably about a one, 
15 over 75 is my normal blood pressure. Can you tell people what that means, by the way? What, what do those numbers mean when you have blood pressure checked? You know, this is just the pressure that is exerted to pump the five liters of blood around your, around your circuit every minute. It takes that pressure to, you know, that's the normal pressure to just kind of get that blood squirting around there. And then it, it comes back at only like two or three or four millimeters of mercury up from the legs. And, and that's, a, that's a more difficult physics problem, right? Because you're over, overcoming gravity at, at low pressures, which is why it's good not to be obese. And it's good to be exercising because those muscles milk the, the blood back through the veins, through the, through the valves, up, up to the heart. And those two numbers, of course, referred to as systolic and diastolic. The systolic is when the heart is squeezing. So during the squeeze of the left ventricle, the pressure at the tip of the, basically in the aorta, is 115 millimeters of mercury. Now, anybody who's ever mucked around with a pressure transducer will actually be surprised at how much pressure that is. That's a non-trivial amount of pressure. If you've had the luxury of operating on people, you know what 115, even a normal 115 millimeters of mercury is. That'll squirt across the room. Across the room. <laughs> but the 75 refers to the relaxation phase of the heart. It says even when the heart is relaxed and in the what we call diastolic phase, receiving its blood supply, there's still quite a bit of pressure in there. 75 millimeters of mercury in my case. Because your vessels are nice and elastic. So, you know, as it receives the bolus of blood, everything expands. And then when, it, when the aortic valve shuts, then those vessels, they rebound a little bit and, and they keep the, take this sort of pulse tile bolus flow and turn it to more of a laminar, less bolus flow. So that elasticity of the vessels are super important. Now you talked about my pulmonary pressures. What are my pulmonary pressures sitting here right now? And I'll I'll confess to you, I have no pulmonary disease, though I've never had a Swan Gans catheter placed in me. So what would you assume my pulmonary pressures are? Oh, they'd be low, you know, like 20, 25 over 15, something like that. Nice and low. Okay. So basically that's the same exercise, but now you're in my pulmonary arteries instead of my systemic arteries. Let's just assert to me that my heart rate's 45 beats per minute. And you said my cardiac output is five liters per minute. So that means every minute my heart sends five liters of blood around my body. So I love that you brought up cardiac output because I think that's the variable most people are sort of failing to appreciate how much that has to improve. So when a weekend warrior like me would try to do his best one hour time trial or when the best cyclist in the world or the best runner in the world is, you know, doing their most exerted thing. What's the variability or the range in cardiac output that we can see from best in the world to sort of weekend warrior to average conditioned person? Just by way of context, if you look down at your hand and make a fist, that's about how big your heart is. This is an amazing pump. So five quarts a minute. Think if you were, you know, squeezing a bowl, five quarts a minute. Five liters per minute. Yep. Five liters per minute. It never stops. And you're a good heart should have about three or four billion beats in it without ever stopping. Okay. It's about a billion beats every 30 years, which is for a math geek like you, it's kind of fun to think about, you know, you know, think about designing a lifestyle and exercise program to sort of minimize the number of heartbeats per year. Okay. And it does involve exercise, but it doesn't involve you know, it doesn't involve Herculean efforts of protracted exercise, all right? But a good athlete like you, an exceptional athlete like you, you go out and do that time trial, that one-hour time trial at 175 beats a minute under load for an hour. You're pumping like 30 or 35 liters a minute. Think about that, you know? 10 gallons a minute, you know, like Lance Armstrong and those, you know, the professional cyclists or cross country skiers will get up to 40, 40 liters per minute. You mistakenly referred to me as an exceptional athlete, which even at the time I wasn't. But yeah, when you do talk about the exceptional, when you talk about Lance Armstrong riding up Alpe d'Huez in 38 minutes, and I, it doesn't matter that he was on EPO, it really doesn't change the metrics of this. 40 liters per minute of cardiac output. You know, to put this in perspective, <laughs> James, I just love this so much because the only times I've ever measured cardiac output 
are in patients in an ICU. I mean, I can't count the number of times I've put a catheter into somebody's lungs to measure and their heart to measure their cardiac output, but it's always been in the setting of a patient under critical care. And in that setting, it would be routine to see two and three liters of cardiac output per minute. And that's with every drug under the sun used to squeeze their heart. And to think that you and I have the luxury of sitting here without a single drug to increase the contractility of our heart. And we're at five liters per minute. And even a couple of old guys like us could probably go out and exercise and still hit 25 liters per minute, but that the best in the world can hit 40 liters per minute. Now let's do some math to get to that volume flow rate. Really their heart rate isn't making up the whole gap because cardiac output is a product of two variables the heart rate and the stroke volume. Can you sort of explain how those play together? Well, right. The stroke volume is, you know, your heart's a pump. And so, you know, in between beats, it fills. So how big it can accommodate, how much, how much volume it can accommodate with each beat is a, an important factor. And I remember Miguel Indurain had some studies done years ago and his heart was basically twice normal size. So you get the heart rate up, the volume goes up, your arterials and venules dilate up so that the resistance goes down. And the heart is actually not just a pump, but it like it rings out the blood. It shortens and twists. And when it's going fast and you're exercising, it's basically sucking blood out of the lungs and the venous system into this uh, to, and, and, and pumping it out as fast as it can. I mean, it's just, it's just an elegant, astoundingly well-designed system when it's used right. And and of course, that's one of the beauties of exercise. You know, you can feel that from you know, as you get into shape, you can just feel yourself being more capable of this. And it's just, it's just intoxicating. And it's one of the beauties why people get addicted to exercise. But, but the point is, to get back to the underlying concept is that you could imagine when you're going that hard, and your blood pressure's up, and your pulmonary pressures are up, and you're doing 25 liters a minute, the soft pliable chambers in the heart, that's the atria, the right and left atria, and the right ventricle, they get distended. They stretch out. Let's pause on that so people see why, James. Because if my cardiac output, which is the dot product of heart rate and stroke volume, meaning if one goes up by twofold, the other can go down by half and they'd stay the same. But if the whole thing has to go up by 6x, and my heart rate's only going up by 3x, because 45 to 170 is about 3x, you have to bring the other one up by 2x. So how do you take up stroke volume that much? Well, part of it is what you just said. You can squeeze harder, you can twist, you can, you can get every last drop out, but there's no getting around what you're just about to explain to people, which is you have to make that chamber a heck of a lot bigger. Right. And... You know, we're designed for this through nature. We're designed to be very active creatures. But, you know, most of the time, if you look at, at tribes in the wild, they're doing like 16 or 18,000 steps a day. But most of that is at a sort of a comfortable walking pace. Lots of times they're carrying things or they might be, they might be lifting, chopping, swimming, you know, whatever, building. And occasionally, at critical times in the hunt or whatever, you know, they might be sprinting. Although the younger members in the tribe would be assigned that task because they're faster runners. But we're not really designed to do what you did when you were doing these, like you still do, you know, do these really long bike rides. The chambers or marathons, ultra marathons, you know, the chambers dilate up and we have enough circulating buffers in our bloodstream because this is like an engine when, you know, like a mu an exercising muscle uses fuel, glucose, fatty acids, ketones, to create energy. But it throws off exhaust. And when you're exercising that hard, it throws off a lot of exhaust in the form of free radicals, okay? We have a lot of circulating buffers in there to basically neutralize those free radicals, but we, we deplete that after 45 to 50 minutes of, of high-intensity exercise. And there's good animal studies showing and human studies showing that diastolic function improves for the first 30 minutes of exercise and by 50 minutes or 60 minutes, it starts to worsen. And the endothelial function will start to worsen too. After you've depleted those antioxidants after 45 or 50 minutes, 
you start like searing the inside of your vessels, those endothelial, those sensitive endothelial linings with high, high free radical levels. And you also start overtaxing the heart muscle. And I'm not saying it's, it's not a big deal, especially when you're young, you know, youth is, you know, when we're young, we're so resilient that you can get away with doing this stuff when you're 15 or 20 or 25 or 30 or 35, and maybe even 40 or 45. But after 45, it starts more likely taking a toll. You start seeing, you know, troponins will rise and, and, and NT pro and BP will rise after really, really strong efforts like, like a marathon. Tell folks what those markers mean, because anybody who's been to an ER with chest pain will know what a troponin is or has taken their grandmother into the ER with heart failure. But for most people, they might not know what those are and why seeing an elevation in those post-exercise should cause us to pause. Yeah. So troponin is one of the proteins that is unique to the heart. And it leaks out of the heart and gets into the bloodstream when there's been some heart damage. You know, we usually associate it with, like you say, heart attacks, where the artery closes off and the mus- muscle is starved for oxygen and it dies downstream in that, unless there's good collaterals. So that really raises our eyebrows uh, and gets us into action when we see an elevated troponin. But a lot of people, I mean, upwards of half or more people after a marathon will have an elevated troponin. It's just the vest at that high level, 25, 30 liters a minute for two and a half, three, four hours. It starts overstretching the muscles in the atria and the right ventricle particularly, and it leaks into the bloodstream. And again, you know, like I tell people, if you want to run a marathon, fine, you know, run one or two, but don't make it, you know, it's like, like, like climbing Mount Everest. You know, if you want to do that, do it once, but don't do it like three times a year. You know, you could do it, brag about it and all that. But this, you know, you got to move on to healthier forms of exercise because these really, especially after age 40 or 45, really protracted exercise will cause this small little micro damage like overstretching and tearing because the high levels of catecholamines and high levels of of free radicals that are now unbuffered. And so if you're designing, like I like to talk about training for longevity is very different than training for peak exercise. And a car buff like you can understand that. It's like if you're going to build a Formula One car to go fast, powerful, the most impressive performance machine ever, it's going to look and perform a certain way. And it's good at that. But it's not going to go 500,000 miles. You know, it's built for power and speed and performance now. Like a car that's going to go 500,000 miles, I don't know, it might be a, you know, a Honda Accord that you're driving never more than 70 miles an hour and you keep and maintaining it really well. And so the point is that you have to really focus on what your goals are. And our goals as an athlete is different than our goals for longevity and health and well-being. You know, I love that analogy and I I appreciate you using it for me because you know how much I do love cars. In fact, I I actually think I I made that comment to a patient this week using a Formula One car as the reference because as you pointed out, James, these are cars that are built for each race effectively. They'll go through three engines in a season. So everything about that is meant to extract the absolute maximum performance. I, again, I want to reiterate what you said. If your goal is to win the Ironman triathlon, nothing we're saying here should pertain to you. We're not going to tell you how to train for that. That is a remarkable feat. I mean, when I think about what it would take to go seven hours in that heat to do what's involved in an Ironman, I can't fathom that. There's never a time in my life when I've even approached the level of raw performance that the winner of Iron Man is going to take, or frankly, even somebody who comes in under 10 hours. But swimming the Catalina Channel in the dark, uh, you know, in, in 10 and a half hours, that is also a pretty remarkable feat that's way beyond what a normal person's anywhere capable of doing. Yeah, perhaps. I've never had to do all three at once. So when I was growing up, I was a good runner, good as a, maybe a stretch. I was a decent, you know, long, long, long distance runner. When I was swimming channels, I could swim for long distances. And, and then when I could time trial, I could time trial. But there's something about the Ironman or triathletes that can do all of those things simultaneously that's always impressed me. But my point is, you're bringing up the important distinction here, which is at some point, an individual has to decide which master they're serving. Are they serving the performance master or are they serving the longevity master? And 
I think everybody goes through a difficult transition here. And I see this struggle with many of my patients, especially the former, you know, exceptional athletes, or frankly, not even people who were themselves exceptional athletes, but people who have also become, I don't know how to describe it, but they've found a new sense of purpose through some of their athletic endeavors. And they've done their first marathon and they've thought, oh my God, this is really a great thing to do because there was a purpose, there was a goal, there was a training plan, there was a camaraderie that came through that. I got to do the thing and now I want to do it again and again and again and again. And they've made a lot of friends doing it too. And it's a, it's a, it's a bonding experience and there's a lot good about that. But I'll just interject my my transitions because I guess I played basketball, you know, competitively at varsity in high school and college, and then for the first two years of college anyway. And then because I felt that that exercise was so important to me, I made this mental note when I stopped playing varsity basketball that I would exercise pretty much every day because I knew it made me happy and healthy. So then I kind of got into running, then triathlons, and I did short, you know, like short distance sprint triathlons, but I hammered. I mean, it trained really hard. And especially during my 30s up until my mid 40s. And I was pretty good, you know, winning like sprint distances, you know, and, and local races and stuff like that. But it was just the fun of the competition and the friends and all that. But then then I started noticing when I'd go out and I also in the back of my mind being a cardiologist, you know, sort of thinking, being proud and happy that, you know, that I'm capable of doing this, you know, in my in middle age. But then I started noticing like when I'd go on really hard rides and do those hard intervals, after I, I, I have this sort of vague sense of like aching in my chest. And sometimes I feel some, like I'm one of those people, maybe you are too, a lot of people who are athletic. You can feel like if I stop right now and, and be quiet, I could count my pulse, just, just feeling every heartbeat. And I could feel some ectopy, some PVCs or some PACs or two or three runs in a row of PACs or S superventricular tachycardia. And I thought, you know what? my heart is not happy about this, you know, and, and it disturbed me a little bit. And I kind of checked a cardio scan. I had a little bit of calcium, 21. But then I started thought about it. And I thought, you know, this is makes no sense. I mean, I'm thinking that if some exercise is good and moderate exercise is better, that extreme exercise is the best. There's nothing in biology like that, where the far extreme, it's usually moderation and especially moderation in the context of what we are evolutionarily designed to do. And what I was doing for a 45 year old was out of bounds with respect to what, you know, my body was expecting. And, and so I started looking into this and, and talking to some of my friends and colleagues from around well, my practice and, and around the world, really, Peter Schnorr and Copenhagen, putting together some databases and showing that, in fact, and this is there in plain sight all the time, by the way, uh, Paffenbarger, one of the godfathers of the exercise movement in his study in the New England Journal of Medicine, pointing out in these Harvard alums that, that exercise improved longevity like eight to 10 years. But in the, in the extreme deciles, it's just a small group of people who were doing the most exercise per week actually lost like 38% of, of the benefit conferred by the less extreme effort. And, and then Ken Cooper, another one of the sort of founding fathers of the modern aerobics uh, movement down in Dallas used to say, if you're running more than 15 miles a week, you're doing it for some other reason.